Hello and welcome to the Mindful Millionaire YouTube channel. Thanks so much for being here. Today I have a treat for you. I have known about Tad Hargrave for a very long time, but we have never had a conversation until today. I'm so excited to share it with you. I had some questions that I wanted to explore with him, but he is a marketing coach. He's been in the business for a long time. He teaches about ethical, compassionate, kind marketing. He is one of a kind, and you're going to get a feel for that in this conversation. I wanted to know about some things, some questions that we explore is, what if you are not supposed to be good at marketing? What if there is another way and how to go about building your business, even if you aren't great at marketing yourself? That's a great question. I'm so excited to share his answer. I also wanted to talk about, um, you know, marketing and the way that it often it comes across as manipulative and controlling and how we can break those patterns. I wanted to hear kind of what his experience has been, how he helps us think differently, taking a step back and thinking about the impact of our marketing in the world that we're living in and the world that we're creating together. Towards the end, I also got to talk to him about how do we use our business for good? How do we take all that we've built in our businesses and share the things that are most important to us with our communities? How can we do that effectively? There are so many stories. There are so many good nuggets of information and thought provoking ideas that get presented in this conversation. I know you're gonna love it. I sure did. I can't wait to watch it again. Just definitely wanna hear what you think, what your takeaways are, leave them in the comments. I'll be sure if there's some follow-up questions to follow up with Tad, but I know you're gonna really love it. Enjoy. Tad, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really pleased about this conversation that it could come together. I've known about your work for many years, and it's an honor to be able to talk with you today. Honor to be here. Could you tell my listeners, my viewers, a little bit more about you? I feel like I could talk for hours, so maybe you're going to be better than I am <laughs> explaining <laughs> what you're about. Almost certainly not, but I'll, I'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't think any of us are ever that reliable at describing ourselves. But um, yeah, the business marketing for hippies .com, which I've been running for 20 years or so. And I started it because I'd had the experience right after high school, working for a leadership development franchise in Edmonton. And I learned a lot around marketing and some of it was, I say the stuff around marketing was a mixed bag, mostly good. And the stuff around sales, uh, mostly bad, <laughs> uh, high pressure, pushy stuff. I was 18 and I thought um, there was no alternative to, to that. This, that's what people do and, and how it is. So I, I did it and I didn't sleep very well at night and, and through a series of, you know, fortunate events, I came across other perspectives and was able to unpack a lot of that, get free of some of the the chicanery, and got a whole business out of it. So, so that's that's the sort of short story, I suppose. This idea of using marketing for good rather than manipulation or hijacking people's attention is what feels like mm -hmm. resonates with when I see everything that you've put together and the conversations that you wanna hold with people. Why do you think that's so important in the world today? Why is it so important to, to use marketing as a force for good? Yeah, versus the other way. Well, you know, Garrison Keillor, uh, radio personality, he had a great line where he said, you get to a certain point in your life and you realize there's no answers, there's just stories. So here's a story. And this is a story I got from a woman 
Flora Sims, amazing storyteller from New York. And it's a Bedouin story. <clears throat> and it goes like this, that there were these two friends, best friends. And nobody could really understand why they were such good friends, because one of them was so generous, always giving to others, always thinking about other people, not so much focused on what do I need, but what's needed uh, you know, in this moment. And his friend was the, the opposite. He was just so selfish. He was always thinking about himself and what's in it for me. Uh, impatient, always playing the short game, not the long game. But for whatever reason, they were very close and had been since they were children. And one day, the generous one, he got a horse. And it's the most beautiful horse you could imagine. And not only was the horse beautiful, I mean, strong, but good with children, happy to do hard work and and the envy of just about everybody such a fine horse and his selfish friend he tries to find it in himself to be happy first friend but just it's constitutionally incapable and so finally he breaks down one day and says look sell me the horse i want to buy the horse generous friend says oh says i you know i love you i'm happy to share the horse with you but i just I've already fallen in love with this horse. This took me years to find, but, but if you ever want to ride the horse or my horse can be of use, please let me know. So his friend feigns, you know, satisfaction with that, and off he goes. He's scheming now, thinking, how do I get this horse? The idea comes to him. The next day, when a generous friend is riding to the market, the selfish one has cloaked himself like a beggar man, holding up his bowl. A generous friend, not seeing his face, not knowing it's a selfish friend, stops and says, oh, beggar man, could you use some shekels in your bowl? And he says, oh, that would be good, but if you could give me a, a lift on your horse to the market, the begging is so much better there, but these old legs won't carry me. It's old man, so he gets off his horse and he helps his selfish friend on the horse, who then grabs the reins, yuck, and off he rides. And he sees what's happened. He sees that in one moment he's lost his best friend and he's lost his horse. Uh, you know, this happens in life. You don't just get one blow, you get two, maybe three in a row, and it's it just uh, can really ruin you. But it also doesn't change who he is deep down, which is this generous person. And so he he reaches inside himself to find something to say that might redeem the moment because he knows he's only going to have one shot and his friend rides off and maybe he never even sees him again. And so you, you have to ask yourself what you would say in a moment like that. This person who was your best friend has betrayed you, taken what you love most, and yet you don't want to um, just react. And so I don't know uh, what you'd say. I have a sense of what I'd say. And uh, wouldn't be polite. But he says, this is my friend, he says, I see what's happening. You're going to leave and you never come back. So, but there's one thing I want to ask of you as you go. And his friend laughs. He says, what? He says that you promise you'll never tell anyone how you came by this horse. Because... If you do, you know how it is. And gossip goes from mouth to ear and mouth to ear and mouth to ear, and it spreads like a wildfire. So if you tell people how you came by this horse, no one in this area will ever give money to the beggars again. Yeah, <laughs> and so this generous friend has got a bigger view of the consequences of his actions and the consequences of selfishness. George Cow, one of my colleagues, he said, if you want to know if your marketing is really kind of sustainable, you could ask yourself, what if everybody did it this way? What would be the consequence on the marketplace? And of course, that's not a hypothetical question. That's how it is now. It's like that. And the, the, the loss of trust that we have, the amount of cynicism there is, is so, so big. You know, if you wouldn't be willing to tell the person you're, marketing to exactly what you're doing it's not ethical if you wouldn't be willing to just break it down of here's what i'm engaged in right now that i'm not talking about um it's it probably just bad news 
and the bad news doesn't end in that interaction. In fact, that's the smallest part of the bad news. The larger part of the bad news is then the next person sits down with them. You know, most of us in dating or relationships, we've gotten together with somebody and we're dealing with the consequences of everybody who hurt them. You know, mm-hmm. most people didn't clean up, so we have, we're the cleanup crew. And, and mm-hmm. lucky us. And then with us, I mean, all around. So there's so much collateral. And there's just a question of, do we want to be you know, a part of the the further damage, or do we want to be a part of the redemption of um, what the, the little tatters of community that are left, which which isn't much, and there's so much coercion in the world. It's I mean, it's in marketing, but it's in our school system, it's in our work environments, it's in our romantic relationships, it's just coercion everywhere, and so marketing it's just a very small corner. It's nothing special or dramatic it's just that this happens to be the area i work in and it's a place not only where is the coercion so normalized i mean i I posted on instagram just the other day a woman i couldn't even believe a lot of people watched the video and said it wasn't until the very end they realized it wasn't a comedy sketch it wasn't a caricature because she was talking about how do you create automatic mindless compliance and she said it with a smile as if there was nothing wrong with it but then, yeah, what happens if you get a society full of automatic, mindless compliance, where people are willing just to do what authority says because authority says to do it? Um, you know, this ends. This never ends well, particularly for minorities, particularly for people in marginalized positions who usually bear the brunt of it. So I just don't want to be a part of that. Um, and I think there's a way that we can relate to people in marketing our work that is... Um, deeply affirming of their own sovereignty of their own humanity and then there's a way of marketing that is so steeped in coercion and so dehumanizing Uh, and sadly it just seems normal because we're so um just drenched in coercion from a very Mm -hmm. early age and we barely notice it which is why when you market in this different way, it's startling for people. They can't believe you didn't go for the clothes. They can't believe they went to your intro workshop and they weren't subjected to this three hour harangue. You know, it's been so normalized. So I don't know, that's at least the start of the response to that. Mm-hmm. You had done marketing um, and then started to see that it didn't make you feel good and and in your bio i read that you had taken time off a period of time to question the assumptions and not everybody necessarily does that because i also compare that to my own journey i've been in marketing and sales pretty much my whole entire it feels like life but um haven't ever had time off Mm. but at the same time, I feel like over and over, I would try things the way that everyone else does it. And then I would figure out that it didn't feel good. And I would go about finding a different way. But I didn't necessarily have such a system. And and I'm curious, when you took time off, and then you came back to it, and probably ever since then, has your goal been to help people or one of the goals to help people come at the marketing from this higher, more witness level of like, what is the ramifications? Like you said, what are the implications if you are to do this? Um, just curious, because that's what came to me as you were talking. Well, it's very generous. It makes it sound like I had a plan. Um. <laughs> like, like there was a grand intention, but it wasn't that. I just worked for this franchise and then it collapsed. There was a major event we did and the event, no fault of the people running it. It's just technology stuff. It collapsed. And I think they'd already been exhausted by the work of it. And they decided, you know, it's just, okay, it's time to call it and to end it. So I was out, out of a job. And at the same time, There were some folks in Santa Cruz, California, doing work I really admired. And everything just sort of lined up for me to move down there. 
and worked with them doing uh, social justice, environmental activist summer camps. And which then had me suddenly going to anarchist protests and, and exploring this whole other side. So going from, you know, being very pro-capitalist when I was younger to, to questioning the whole racket. And then, and then it was just, I had friends who still had businesses needed to market themselves. And I knew more than they did. And that was all. I mean, I wasn't any expert, but I just, I did know more than them. And so I, um, I started teaching and I came across the work, uh, just on a random, this was, uh, I wasn't looking, but this guy, Ari Galper, he did a, maybe a Google ad or something for something he called them reverse selling at the time. And he was the first one I'd ever heard who, who talked about, and still to this day, one of the only people who talks about it this lucidly of we don't go for the sale, we go for the truth and visit a fit. And he had he had done that heavy lifting of unpacking all this stuff from his own painful experience. And I just drank it up. You know, it was like a mana from heaven for me because I was still so torn up by what I'd gone through and what I'd learned. And it's a terrible thing to feel like, but I had to do those things or I have to do those things and there's no other way to do it, but it doesn't feel good, but I have to. It's a real tear inside because then it's either I do marketing that works, but I can't sleep well, or I do marketing that doesn't work, but I've got a, a clear conscience. You know, it's either I, I'm ethical or I'm effective and I've got to make it a choice. But the truth was a lot of the pushy stuff didn't really work that well anyways. It wasn't so dramatically effective and often ineffective. And so I came across his stuff and, and then the light bulb started going off. And then over the years, you know, there's just been more threads that came in, but that was really the first thread that helped me un begin to untangle what had become such a, a knotted mess in my mind uh, that I didn't want to go anywhere near because I couldn't imagine how to untangle it. So it wasn't really me. You know, I, I was on the receiving end of somebody who'd done that untangling work. Uh, and I could kind of, it was like Ikea, you know, I had the instructions and now I could take <laughs> all those parts that I had and start to figure out how to put them together into what's become my business now. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think that one would hope that people who are feeling the tug that this is out of alignment are asking themselves questions of maybe there is a better way. Maybe, maybe I don't have to do it that way. One of the things that I know you had perhaps an epiphany about that I'd love to share with, with everyone is this idea of what if you're not supposed to be good at your own self-promotion or your own marketing. And I think just even hearing that for folks might be like, wait a minute, doesn't everyone as a business owner have to be good at that? But you were questioning that assumption. Can you bring us into that conversation? Thank you. Yeah, uh, that really hit me in Toronto. I noticed it was a, a number of times it kept coming up from people in the groups. They'd say, well, you know, I know I should be better at marketing my stuff. And how do I be better at marketing myself? How do I? Um, there's often some shame in there, some sort of, you know, self-abashed, oh, I, I, I ought to be better at this. And I just questioned that. I just remember, I mean, working with Stephen Jenkinson, uh, orphanwisdom.com. He has this real gift of seeing the trouble in the question that often there are premises smuggled into questions that the premise is the problem. And I began to see like, wait a second, this idea that we're supposed to be good at marketing ourselves, is, is that true? Is that really the arrangement? And as soon as I even had the thought, it all came that, of course, it's not true, that this is the great human kryptonite. This is what makes us all weak at the knees is self-promotion, you know. Um, and, and I would joke, I say, you know, the only people who are really good at um, self-promotion and shameless talking about themselves all the time, uh, psychopaths. Yeah, the rest of us, it doesn't feel good. 
uh, it's and that's normal. That's a very huge. That's not evidence of a limiting belief. It's evidence of a conscience. It's evidence that you're a human being, and there's just something in our hard wiring where self promotion doesn't feel comfortable. I don't know why. I don't know where that comes from, but I'll, I just consistently see that that's true. So that's our kryptonite, and that's just how it is. And people are only ever going to get less shitty at promoting themselves, and that's it. No one's ever going to get really good at self-promotion. Uh, and, in fact, if they do, we trust them less. Oh, that person's very smooth. Wow, they're so slick. And all of a sudden, the trust goes down. There's something very trustworthy about the... Um, I remember talking with Martin Shaw. He was just visiting a storyteller from England. He was in BC. He said when he was growing up, his father said, said, you never tell a story out of, you never tell a story about yourself unless you come out badly in the end. Like bragging about you, that's other people's job. But if you're going to tell a story, you do it in a way that's self-effacing, that doesn't put you above other people. Maybe puts you one peg down, you know, in not in a shameful way, but in um, some humility, not a bad idea. And so this is just human kryptonite. But then what's the superpower? Because if, if kryptonite makes you allergic, it presumes there's some uh, superpower there. And I say that our superpower is promoting other people. That's the great human. We're all so good at it. Um, we're useless promoting ourselves, but we're so good at promoting other people. And most of us have businesses that owe good parts of their good fortune to our word of mouth. It could be a musician, it could be a crafter, it could be a farmer, it might be a restaurant, a bookstore, you know, that we talk them up so much. And it's very easy. It's effortless. You know, if you go to a networking event and your intention is to try to get a client to sign up that night and promote yourself, oh man, it's so hard. But if you go with a friend and you say, tonight, I'm just going to work the room for you, we instantly all feel how different that is for everybody involved for the person who's being networked for, for you and for the people receiving it. It's a better vibe. But if I walk around trying to promote myself all night, everybody just has to put up with me. You know, everybody's kind of dealing with me. And I'm dealing with the part of me that's just no, 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 no. And I have to take um, what I've taken to calling uh, Novocaine for the soul. Because everything in me is saying this is the wrong arrangement but I got to numb myself to that in order to persist. And then people can read the numbness. There's something about it that seems off because I'm not paying attention to the cues because I can't afford to, because all my attention is on. Uh, isn't it amazing how much attention it takes to ignore something? And uh, so, yeah, we're just, we're no good at it. And then that seems like a recipe for hopelessness. Like, well, then how are you going to market your business? If I'm saying, which I am, that we're not good and we'll never be good at self-promotion. But this, this comes from the assumption that you need to be good at promotion uh, to grow your business and you don't. The, it changes the whole dynamic and you realize the purpose of marketing is about making it easier for the people who love you to spread the word. Yeah, is to, is to first of all, make something so good that people want to talk about it. Second is to make it easier for them to want to talk about. And third, just to say thank you a lot to the people who spread the word um, and maybe reward people who do, you know, if that's appropriate or, um, but that's the, so word of mouth, in other words, this is how marketing actually works. It's how businesses actually grow. I mean, just statistically, if you looked at the numbers of, oh, let's look at all the clients and how did they hear about it? It's almost none of them. Oh, because I met this person and they shamelessly promoted themselves to me. Almost everybody a friend told me. So it's it really reduces the stress if you let go of this thought that you're supposed to be so smooth and slick and good uh, at self-promotion entirely. And just stop trying to stop putting any effort in that direction. And instead, instead of putting effort into that action, to put effort into the architecture of your business. Yeah, crafting really good offers for a particular group. Um, crafting really simple ways that people could share it up if they wanted to. And then crafting systems that make sure you're you're acknowledging and thanking people when they spread the word. Mm -hmm. 
I know that um, what feels like fits inside of what you're describing is niching, like having a very, very specific area because yeah. nowadays, I mean, both of us are coaches, depending on the circles that you hang in, you might be surrounded by, let's say a hundred different coaches who are all helping businesses. But when they all look like they're doing the same thing, it's hard to give and receive referrals from one another. But when you start to go down into very specific things that you're helping people with because you're so good at that thing and everyone's doing that, now all of a sudden you can have this like sea of cooperation and community and support rather than competition. Amen. I mean, it's funny. I just don't, when people talk about competition, I don't, I just don't get it. I mean, I do understand what they're saying, of course, but I relate to it much more as you do of, of, uh, these are colleagues. They're not competitors. I mean, uh, my colleague, George Cow talks about them as niche mates. You know, they're just other people who are doing a similar type thing, but it's never identical. And I've taken to using a lot of this Venn diagram of the old journalistic, you know, W5 plus H, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. And just something about our business needs to be unique. Uh, if it's so generic and that so seems the same, like, oh, I'm a yoga teacher. What makes you different? Nothing really. Well, then why would I choose you? And the only reason I'd probably choose you is maybe you, you're closer geographically or you're cheaper. That's about it. But otherwise, uh, no. And really, if I let's say I'm dealing with anxiety and it's all the way on the other side of town, it's twice the price, but it's yoga for anxiety, I'll probably make the trip. So my understanding of niche is that it's you know just your role in the community, your role in the marketplace that you want to be known for. And that role has those six elements, the who, what, where, when, why, and how, and they're the simplest, I mean, how you can't get any simpler one word questions, who, <laughs> what, you know, but hard to answer. Most businesses I know don't really have a good solid answer to those questions. You don't have to have a unique answer to all of them, but to some of them. And yes, the clearer we get in our answers, the more we um, see other people as collaborators, not as competition. We see them as, as a, ah, we could work together. I could refer to them. I mean, just this morning, I was on a call with Rebecca Van Dam, who does a lot of social media coaching. At a certain level, we do the same thing. We're business marketing coaches for coaches, for the most part. And yet we work together all the time, because she really focuses on the social media piece, and I don't. And she knows a lot about the technical side of it, and, and just has more to say there than I do. So I can refer to her. And I have so many colleagues I love referring to. I love coming across other people who do those little, oh, you specialize in LinkedIn. You're good at helping people with their bios. You can help them write their homepage. I love that to be able to refer out so that I don't have to know. Uh, I don't have to know everything. But the the easiest way to kill it, I mean, there's a lot of ways to grow a business, but the, there seems to be one central way to kill a business, which is you try to be everything to everybody. And then it's just, you know, uh, good night, Irene. It's it's all over pretty quickly. So we can't be everything to everybody. We just have to choose some place we're going to stand, something we're going to be known for, something we're going to offer up that others aren't or offering it in a way that they aren't or for reasons others aren't offering it. There's got to be something. Um, yeah, so amen. Mm -hmm. is a a real fundament of the whole thing. Sometimes is it as simple as someone is so broad and they don't realize, again, back to self-promotion, I would also say sometimes it's really hard for people to know what it is that they're really good at versus mm. good at. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's true. Um, You know, there's the old Irish proverb that says, um, scan mass soul carriage, which means a, a friend's eye is a good looking glass, a good mirror. It's very hard to see ourselves clearly. 
So yeah, not only are we terrible at marketing ourselves and, and promoting ourselves, we're just terrible at seeing ourselves. We're terrible at, we have a very limited perspective on the whole thing. And uh, <laughs> one sec, there's somebody who has no problem with self-promotion. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> he is constantly promoting himself, so okay. Psychopaths like <laughs> and roosters. No, no problem. Just making noise and attracting attention. Um, is he your? Is he your pet? No, no. That, I'm, it's on the land I'm living on. There's chickens and uh, and uh, and this one rooster that are running around all over the place right now. <laughs> okay, we had a loss in Wi-Fi connection, and now we're back. <laughs> Thanks for staying with us, Tad. I wanted to shift the conversation a bit and ask you about business owners and the the way of using our business and our voice and and all that we have put into our businesses to help guide the world in the ways that are most important to us. And what I mean by that is there is a lot of disruption happening mm. in, especially in the United States. I was just in France for 10 days and it was quite refreshing to not be confronted with um, some of the things going on here. Although they have their own set of challenges in France. <laughs> we did see some of the protests, but um, I'm curious because many, people start their businesses because they want to break free of the establishment. They don't want to have to dance to someone else's tune. And yet we get into our businesses and we start making money and we start creating communities. And, you know, one of the things that's kind of hard right now is nobody knows how anybody else thinks about a lot of things <laughs> like there's a lot of confusion and so by taking a stand in one way you have no idea what's going to happen um in mm. the community and what what's funny to me and it's not that i think i'm saying you can't speak up about things because it's going to disrupt other people what i think is hard right now is I just want to talk about it. I don't necessarily feel like I have all the answers, but it's gotten to the point where it's even hard to open discussions in a very neutral way to allow discussions to happen so that growth and evolution can take its place through the form of our business. And so I'm curious about the ways that you approach these things. And if I've got it all wrong, more than happy to to talk about that too but just curious about about how do you go about this right well so there's there's a few dynamics here one is that so uh, for various reasons people don't want to work for the man be that government or corporations or uh, or just somebody else we just want to be self-employed we want the, the freedom that that affords and but the reason we go self-employed is versus employed by somebody else is because employment is still needed uh on on a few levels but let's just focus on financially you gotta you know most of us like to eat we like living somewhere and so in this system then we need to make some money and so then the strategy we choose is self-employment. And of course, that doesn't end up being as easy as it said on the tin. Uh, but, you know, people find their way somehow. I mean, I remember when I first started, I was so broke. Man, but it, it, I would have rather been broke doing what I love than making more money doing something I hated. So... But, you know, th there is a breaking point where you, you have to make a call. Uh, it's, you know, it's, you're either homeless or you're going to get a job. So we don't want it to get there. And there's the economic thing that we're aiming at, some kind of sufficiency. And then there's the authenticity piece. 
And Gabo, I mean, so it's, I think maybe to just bring this into a broader context than just business, the way Gabo Mate talks about it is as a child, we have these attachment needs. Yeah, and those have a lot to do with sustenance and food. Um, just our basic physical and emotional needs being met, which is the same thing with the business. And so these attachments are very important. But then we also, there's the need for authenticity. Uh, but if there's a conflict between authenticity and attachment, uh, especially as a child, boy, attachment wins every time. Because if you do something that displeases your parent, maybe you don't get food, maybe they aren't going to love you anymore, and we just can't bear it. So as we become an adult, I suppose that's part of being an adult, is that we can risk attachment more. And this is so many people throughout history have stood against the masses. Um, you know, when in insanity gripped the nation. And, you know, you could look genocides all around the world. Whenever there were genocides and there was a sort of mass uh, mania that came about, there were people who stood against it. Uh, so on, on issues big and small, but when you do that, it's um, you really do risk the attachment. You risk losing the economic basis. Uh, um, you risk your business being destroyed. There are many, many people throughout history in various times and places who took a stand against something and really, uh, at the material social level, lost um, lost everything. Some of them lost their lives, and some of them then found new communities on the other side. And there's no easy fix on this one. This is one of the most confounding uh, troubles of the adult world is how do you get that balance right of authenticity and attachment? You know, there's certain things I just don't talk about. Um, maybe when I set this business down, I might, maybe I might not. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways to be active. I suppose that's another way of saying it. You can be very overt and you can be covert. You can be um, explicit or implicit. You can um, you can do these things on the side or you can do them as a core of your business. And there's no right way to do it, but I think everybody has to really figure out what are they constitutionally best set up for? Because I've seen people go out and challenge some popular narrative. You know, maybe they question big pharma or they question... Um, you know, an antidepressants or birth control or something, or or uh, modern obstetrics, and boy, they just get crucified by their community. You know, the the, and it's very painful and painful enough. It it probably would have been better that they didn't do it. And I know some other people who've been very liberated by it. I mean, they really lost a whole friend group, but now they they are free at a level they never have imagined, and they found a whole group of new people, and might even be making more money. Uh, you know, with that new crowd. So, I mean, this is just a big commiseration on the on the dynamic. It's not easy, but I think it's it, in the same way with entrepreneurship. There's this question of how risk averse are you, uh, and mm -hmm. investing, you know, and are, are how risk tolerant are you? We have to look at that in terms of speaking out. But the one thing I will underscore for people, just maybe as an affirmation and a blessing, is there's absolutely no relationship between how popular a view is and how true it is. There's a lot of metrics we could use for truth and how we come to that. Uh, and it's and that's one of the most important you know, conversations. You know, How do we know things? Who are the trusted sources? And there's a lot of metrics you could use of how trustworthy uh, someone or something is, how true someone uh, seems to be or their words. But popularity just doesn't seem to be a consistent enough one to really lean on. Just because all the um, people in the church saw things a certain way doesn't mean Galileo was wrong. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that he was right. It's just not a factor in particular that the masses think a certain way. The masses have time and time again been on the wrong side of history. Yeah, you know, um, the masses were on the side of slavery. 
in various places, not just the United States. All, you know, for a time mm -hmm. that would that was a thing. I mean, who built the Parthenon? <laughs> who built uh, the Acropolis? You know, it wasn't it wasn't the rich people. And so, and but when I say the masses, I should also clarify. I'm talking about the masses in within empire, within in the mainstream dominant society. The masses within a healthy indigenous culture are probably very trustworthy. But the masses in whatever this is that we've cooked up here, this this modern maelstrom of of um, drip lit, you know, strip malls, this with synthetic food, uh, synthetic relationships synthetic clothing, all this. Um, if, you know, it's one of the things I've thought a lot about, which certainly is is germane to marketing, is this idea of spells and spell casting. Uh, I think it's very traditionally understood that spells are primarily cast with the tongue. They're cast by speech. And there was a fellow, uh, Edward Bernays, who was, I believe, the nephew of Freud, and he was the one who crafted propaganda, basically. And a lot of the modern marketing techniques come out of this fellow. And, and then schools of thought that came from him. And if propaganda, I mean, another word for that to me is just spell casting. And so then you get very good, decent people doing horrific things, treating other people horrifically because they're under a spell. And they don't know it. And so to me, one of the most important questions we can be asking in the modern times uh, is how would you know if you were under a spell? And that's not immediately apparent because one of the features of being under a spell is it has its own defense mechanism. I mean, when I was doing this, the pushy, aggressive sales stuff, I had that fully rationalized. Uh, you you would never have convinced me I was under a spell. I, people tried, actually, at the time. There's some people who were concerned of how plastic and fake I was becoming, but I couldn't see it. And couldn't have convinced me I was trying to cast spells on other people when that's precisely what a lot of the marketing is. So I... So you, you wouldn't know automatically, but there are a few telltale signs. One, if you feel stressed all the time, that's probably an indicator. But the other is this. You can imagine if you live in a healthy society or a healthy culture, we'll say, and you're the one under the spell, you would be acting differently than everybody else. There'd be something off about you that set you apart. But let's say you live in a spellbound society. Well, then you'd be acting the same as everybody else. So then the fundamental question is, is the society you're in healthy or not is this a society or is it a culture and that's i think one of the bigger questions uh facing us because if you're willing to submit that we live in a society that is probably largely spellbound and what's the evidence that a society is spellbound people are unhealthy people are unhealth unhappy and people are, are weak you know in in all the important ways and in a healthy culture, they are healthy and they're happy and they're strong. It doesn't mean no grief, of course, and no no mystery and all this. It's just um, there's a resilience. And in in a, if you're under spells, I think because spells blind you to how it is, they just fundamentally um, the way a spell functions is by they um, debilitate you at some level. So then if you look at your society and you say, oh, this society seems to be getting less and less resilient, more and more fragile, then it's worth looking at, um, you know, <laughs> am I acting like them? Do I see things the exact same way? And the last thing I'd say in terms of spells is, I, you know, I contrast spells with stories. I wrote a whole piece about this on um, my Substack, but a story is something traditionally that would be told that would make the world more available to you, that would bring the world to you, but in a, in images, yeah, indirectly, but it's still, you can recognize the world in it, and it helps you recognize the world that you're in, whereas a spell kind of blinds you, occludes this. And 
stories come from the land fundamentally if you ask most indigenous people you know it came from their history things that happened to them and and from the land they live on that's where the stories come from but spells don't come from the land spells come from power uh, almost universally spells are imposed from above to the to below and we live in the a day and age of the most sophisticated spell casting machinery the world's ever seen uh, so if you find yourself agreeing with billionaires it's probably it's just worth pausing <laughs> If most of the elite in the world see things a certain way and you realize you're you're waving the same flag, I just think that's worth a caution. If your views line up more with um, the elite uh, than with the indigenous people of the world, I think that's a moment for real profound reconsideration. So that's my long, long answer to your question. Mm, super helpful. I really appreciate this introduction, I've never heard it used in this way about spells. And, and I think I would just add that one of the things that has held me back from speaking broadly about a topic is when I notice that, that, that there's a sense of righteousness inside of my viewpoint, then I'm curious. Yeah. And, and I'll use your language. I think what I would be questioning is what spell, like I can see that other people are under a spell, but what spell am I under that's affecting me in the way that I think I know better? And oftentimes when I go down that into that questioning, what I realize is that I am not actually a witness to what's going on. I'm merely uh, on one side of, you know, this other side. And from that place, I am not helpful. And my guess is when you describe those situations where people spoke out about a situation, they were still inside of that thing rather than being a witness to what was actually happening. Because when we step way back, we can, be far more helpful, um, even if it was only just to speak from our own personal experience about that thing, we can touch everyone from that place, potentially. I mean, who knows if people are open, but not when we have an agenda of, I have this all figured out and you don't. Well, and you know, maybe one of the biggest spells that we can be under is that other people shouldn't be under spells. <laughs> You know, or, or that spells have no role, that spells are just mm. bad. I mean, the, the what I laid out around the difference of spells and stories, that's not saying there shouldn't be any spells in the world. Mm. Spells can be a real mercy. Um, I mean, I was talking with with a fellow and he he knew a family and that their son died at 12 years old. They knew the son was going to die. He had a genetic condition. And, and, and the time finally came and he died. And the fellow said, he said, after the funeral, he said, I normally don't, but I went home and I just drank myself to sleep. I just drank myself blind, basically. That's a spell, uh, meaning it debilitates something. And for some people, what it debilitates is the grief, or some, for some people, what alcohol will do is debilitate the thing that debilitates the grief so that they can actually feel. And so it's it's not wrong. It's just consequential. Of course, you know, alcohol has its uh, other consequences which can come with it. Pharmaceuticals, I think, work the same way. They, the painkillers function by they, they turn something off in us. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, I've been in the hospital at times in extreme pain. And I was, I'll, I'll take all the spells you got. Do you know the <laughs> spell that can make this pain go away? So sometimes the spell is what you need. You can't just be in the blazing sun all day. A cloud in between you and the sun can be just the right thing, even though it stops you from seeing the sun clearly. Uh, mm -hmm. So spells are not bad. And yeah, this this idea that other that A, that spells shouldn't be there, and B, that other people shouldn't be under them, is, um, uh, yeah, that in itself becomes a spell. Because then we're relating to people, well, you shouldn't be seeing things the way you're seeing things, you should, you know, and that's how useless is that? 
to be coming at somebody as if they shouldn't be seeing things the way they are. If we engage in people from that kind of judgment, you know, where we speak from, we speak to. So I speak from the judgment, judgmental place in me, and I'm going to hit that place in somebody else and they'll feel judged or they'll want to judge me. So for the most part, I tend not to even, the older I get, the less I even engage in these conversations, unless I see there's an openness. And this is, you know, to tie it back to marketing, there's something that's so missing in marketing, which is just old fashioned courtesy. So before you go into a shameless pitch for something, you know, especially one-on-one, -on -one, it's very helpful to say, hey, um, I think I might be able to help you with this. Are you, can I give you a five minute pitch on this? Can I give you my, my spiel? Cause I think you might like this and you're, you're getting consent. You know, you're, you're checking in to see, do they actually even want to hear this at all? Cause they may say, you know, I think I'm good. Hey, that's perfect. Great. And you just let it go. No pressure. But we, that we're so lacking in courtesy and so much of marketing is assumption and a uh, lack of permission and pushiness which we hate to do and we hate to be on the receiving end of it. So courtesy is a thing. And it's the same with the spells that if we think somebody's under a spell, and of course it's true, we could be the one under a spell, but I think the, the, one of the things we can do is approach with this courteous kind of not fearful, but careful, full of care, not full of fear. And just to say, Hey, I notice you see things differently than me, and and uh, I'm wondering if you'd be open to talking about that. I know this is such a divisive issue, and maybe you've had your fill of it, and you can't even bear another conversation. And I would totally understand, but I would love to understand how you see it. Um, and if you'd be open to hearing how I see it, you know, I'd love to share that. I just see so much division here, and and um, I feel like the the position I have is is often you know, misrepresented and maybe not well understood. And, and it would mean a lot to share, but hey, no pressure. You know, we check in first. There's the story of uh, Briar Rose, the old folktale, uh, Sleeping Beauty. And, you know, a very short version, a daughter is born. They invite uh, 12 of the 13, you know, uh, fairy godmothers. The one who doesn't come is really pissed. She doesn't get invited because they don't have enough plates. So she shows up and she curses the child to die from a finger prick on her 15th birthday. Everything's done to prevent that. Um, but it happens. And the only reason she doesn't die is because the 13th fairy godmother says, I take this death and I spread it out over everyone in the kingdom and everyone will sleep for 100 years. So around the kingdom grows this briar hedge, thorns everywhere. And it's littered with the skeletons of princes and, you know, knights who've tried to get in and then just <laughs> impaled and uh, they never made it. And one day, about a hundred years later, this young man shows up, asks an old man, is it true? The legend about this, you know, princess sleeping in there and the whole kingdom sleeping in there. He says, oh, it's true. But I wouldn't go, you know, there's, there's evidence on the hedge of, of a lot of failure here. And he says the key phrase, he says, I'm not afraid. And as he walks up, it parts for him and opens. And, and so he comes in. And I think central to this is that one is the timing. There's such a thing as right timing. And we've got to learn how to read a room. Sometimes it's not a good moment to bring it up. A moment in their life, a moment of what's happening in the environment. So we got to pick the moment. But number two, if we walk up scared, it doesn't work. And the, the, you know, Byron Katie talks about there's two fears, basically. One is the fear that we're not going to get what we want. And the other is the fear that we're going to lose what we have. And any agenda to get somebody to change their mind will create fear in us. Because then, oh, I'm going to not do it right. And they're going to keep believing what they believe. And oh my God, if they believe what they believe, then the world will end tomorrow. So this is very high stakes and it's, it's I'm diffusing a bomb. And, you know, and you bring that kind of fear and people feel it. Uh, versus um, just being a bit more chill about the whole thing. You know, loving people no matter what. I heard of a dating coach and he was out in the infield with this guy and he was following him around the bar and his whole coaching that night was just going, chill, 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 chill. Because <laughs> the guy was so ginned up. And I think around these conversations, we can get so 
ginned up. But I found if you read them, if you read the moment, sometimes there are times you're sitting with somebody and a topic comes up and you just say, could I share my crazy out there idea? Are you open to hearing my outrageous conspiracy theory take on things? <laughs> you know, but it's light. Or, you know, you could say, are, are you open to hearing my just fuddy-duddy conservative take on this? Or my out there leftist take, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. My hippie, wi- witchy, pagany take on it. If it's said with a smile and like, are, are you open to this? Very often they say, yeah, okay, what is it? And you say, well, I just see it like this. And if we can do it without making anybody wrong, it's just, this is how I see it. This is the understanding I've come to. And we just sort of put it down on the table. I think the mistake people make in marketing and in this kind of, uh, these kinds of conversations is it's like you, you have something and you're just trying to force it into their hand. Like read this, you've got to read this book. This is so important. And it's a much better deal for everybody. If you just kind of drop it and you say, uh, you put it on the table and you say, this book just is so important to me. And can I give you the, my pitch on this book? I think you might love it. Are you open? Okay, here's here's the two minute pitch. And then you 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 walk away and you say, anyways, there it is. Uh, if you're interested, check it out. No pressure. And you And you mm-hmm. back off. You don't keep pressuring and pushing and pushing. And the chances are they're not going to pick it up. And that's fine. But it might be the thing that plants a seed. And then they're talking with somebody later. And they say, have you heard about this book? And I say, no shit, I was at a party. And this guy just, huh, you're the second person now. Do you want to borrow my copy? I got so many books. And then, you know, we've we've had this in our lives where, have you heard about this book? It's like, you're the third fucking person to tell me about this book. And at a certain point, okay, maybe I should take this seriously. You know, like most of us, maybe we had a certain view most of our life on something. We were convinced it was that way. You know, I'm vegan or I'm, I eat meat or whatever it was. And we, you could not have convinced us. And then we start coming across information and and at first you just brush it away, but eventually it gets through. So if we think we have to be the straw that breaks the camel's back, that's a lot of pressure to put on a moment. But if you can just put the straw there and walk away and say, hey, there you go, just for your consideration, mm-hmm. you know, uh, more, li- more likely to succeed. What I'm learning from this conversation is exactly what I know that you teach your clients about marketing, but how it's resonating with me is that the times that we're in perhaps require a new set of tools in which to engage. And, you know, I do come from, I know you talk about trauma informed um, in your work, but I do come from a background. uh, I shared a little bit with you in an email a lot of trauma in my background and noticing the tendencies that we create in our lives as a result of that trauma. And I know I'm not alone. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of hurt people out there in the world sort of trying to find their way uh, into creating a happy life in spite of the trauma that they have felt. But perhaps, um, there's a sense of desperation for some, myself included, right? Of like, I may not have learned these tools when I was growing up, or I may do things because of the trauma I experienced in my business, in my life, but I'm ready and I'm ripe for a new set of tools so that I can create, you know, for, for the life that I, that I live and at least the people that I surround myself with a more healthy, sustainable, communicative, loving, kind environment. And I feel like that's a lot of what you are teaching through your work. Well, and the, the only um, way I might say it a bit different is, is there's no doubt there's new tools that are needed and also very old tools. The, the more I learn, the more it's um, everything I talk about uh, a little grandiose but a lot of things i talk about i think my ancestors would recognize you know courtesy and care and uh, you know courage all these things is very old and these these um these ways of uh etiquette of not putting pressure on people letting people save face 
these are old cultural tools and approaches that that go back a long 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 way from people you know who who um figure this out before we ever came to it so i'm i'm all for the new approaches certainly we got to innovate for the times that we're in and uh and there's a lot from the old world that we can use with profit. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And um, I think part of the reason I say new is if you weren't exposed to it sure. when you were growing up, then it is new. <laughs> yeah. But I love that quote that if you don't, those who don't understand history are bound to repeat the mistakes of the past. So. Um, <laughs> Right there with you, Tad. This has been such a beautiful conversation. What can folks do next if they want to come and, and learn more about you? I know you offer some really cool things. Can you share? You know, I suppose the main thing, if you just go to marketingforhippies.com, there's a ton of free stuff there. The main thing is I've got this ethical marketing starter kit, and it's the footage of a day-long workshop that I toured all around uh, North America, some of Europe, uh, that I used to sell charge money for now it's just free and that's available and then if people uh want to dig in a bit deeper there's a, a membership that i have marketingforhippies.com slash membership uh so it's 100 us a month there's a bunch of stuff included that's you know articulated on the uh on that page i really um was surprised because i think in the past, that program was double the cost, if I'm not mistaken, and the price has been lowered. Is that my imagination? It's I had a, a mentorship, and that was 400 US a month, mm. uh, but that was limited to 12 uh, people at a time. So this is a membership mm -hmm. where there's many more people and and uh, so and more more mm. accessible and more affordable. Yeah. But kudos to you because it's not easy to offer what you're offering at that low price. And so I really honor you for making that available to people. Thank you. Oh, bless you. Thanks again for being here. What a treat. What I, I don't often get to get into these conversations around spells and stories. So thank you. That's a, it's a real, uh, it's a good time for me. <laughs> Thanks for trusting me for it. <laughs> Blessings. Thanks everyone for, for being here.